So, cool. It's funny, actually, I saw the video up there, and I was, I'm actually, I've been lucky enough to be on the board of DocuSign and also on the board of Box. You saw Aaron Levy talk about what it's like to be, to be a founder when people think you're going to run away to Disneyland. I always think with Keith, people look at him and think, oh my God, that man's going to be the CEO of Disney Corp. <laughs> it's a different look. So um, I'll give a brief bio on Keith, not the uh, kind of formal bio, but the, the real bio that we got when we were finally interviewing him. You know, Keith grew up in the Midwest, went to Purdue. All you really need to know about Keith is not that he was president of his school fraternity, but that he was president of his national fraternity. All you really need to know about American business is that he was wildly successful thereafter. <laughs> Sorry, didn't work for you guys. Um, so yeah, Keith, Keith worked at GM first of all, then he came out to the Silicon Valley. His first deal was Rasner Corporation, very successful exit, sold for $500 million to Parametric Corporation in 1995 when $500 million was a reasonably large amount of money. He then went on to found Ariba. Ariba was one of the most successful enterprise software companies of the 90s, uh, went public and had a peak market cap in 99 of $34 billion. And at some point, we'll talk about how it, it fared from there. Most recently, Keith was retired. He was on a number of boards. He was chairman of Purdue. And in a brilliant piece of venture value ad, one of my colleagues on the DocuSign board got a call from someone who was doing a reference on Keith, and they said Keith was thinking of getting back to work and being chairman, a CEO of a software company. And the value add moment was realizing that if he's going to be CEO of a software company, by God, he should be CEO of ours. So we, we offered him, he accepted. It's been two years, we couldn't be happier. Uh, DocuSign's going really well, it's going really fast. I'm a big believer in two points really does make a line. And all I want to point out to you, Keith, is your first deal sold for $500 million. Your second deal sold for $34 billion, and this is your third deal. So no pressure. <laughs> so let's start with leadership. You've been a leader. You've been a leader at Ariba, DocuSign. You've been chairman of the Board of Governors at Purdue, and I did mention that fraternity. <laughs> what is your leadership style? Uh, well, you know, I think uh, it really depends on the situation. So if you would look at uh, being chairman of the Board of Trustees at Purdue, it's probably more consensus building, facilitator. Uh, that kind of thing. Every now and then, an individual contributor, like go finding the next president, which was a 12-month sales cycle where we hired the uh, sitting governor of uh, Indiana, Mitch Daniels. You look at um, uh, chairman of the board of Angie's List, that's probably more of a coach, maybe pattern recognition uh, and helping with strategy. If you look at DocuSign, it'd be a combination of those plus, I think, a little uh, lead follower, kind of get the heck out of the way kind of thing. Um, you know, really um, probably more of a, a, a driving style, but yet I think uh, surrounding yourself with, uh, with great people. And talk about the passion for the job. I mean, we had a long, look, you've done extremely well. We had a long conversation before you joined, being really transparent. Did you really want to do this? What, what would make you, your level of success in life, get up in the morning, go on the sales calls? And I actually will give an anecdote before I do that. The reason I knew I wanted to hire Kate was we had this tricky little deal we were trying to get done. It totally, a sale with a very small company that we are trying to acquire. It totally blew up. Everyone involved was pointing fingers. Keith was chairman of the board. And instead of giving up, he drove down to the VC, sat in his office for four hours. This is Keith Crack. He'd been the CEO of a $34 billion company and doorstepped him and tried to get the deal alive. <laughs> and that was the passion that I saw. What makes you passionate about DocuSign? Uh, Why do you bother? Well, you know, the, the, the coolest thing about DocuSign is that it is really a way to uh, change the world uh, in terms of um, something that's been done 10,000 years, paper and pen. Uh, so uh, it's going to affect um, every company. It's going to affect every consumer. Um, it's just going to give people a lot more freedom. Uh, and, and, and so really being able to, to, to uh, uh, make a difference uh, is huge. And then the other thing that's, that, that's cool is that it is just absolutely a huge market. Um, every company, every department in the company, every person, and the opportunity to be the standard. Uh, not just to be the leader, but to be the, the standard. And, and then, you know, it's, it's to build a, a, a great team. And, you know, the thing we talk about inside at DocuSign is, you know, Someday you're going to be bouncing your grandchildren on your knee and they're going to say, hey, Grandpa, you know, were you one of those early guys at DocuSign? And that's going to be, I think that's going to be a cool thing. So 
We'd like to think so. Right on. Good deal. So let's talk about, you know, it's a buzzword, but it's also true. It's the consumerization of IT. Yeah. And, you know, it's, again, it's funny, but, but Box and DocuSign benefit from many of those yeah. trends, that individual yeah. adoption, yeah. which really becomes a forcing function yeah. for enterprise sales. Yeah. And you know, lots of these companies, and what we see is these companies, many of the people, the startups here today, you, know, yeah. you start off selling maybe freemium, maybe yeah. just a small business, but you can parlay that right. into big enterprise sales. Right. I think it'd be really interesting for folks to hear about how you think about, you know, we started off with teeny tiny customers, yeah. individual real estate agents, right. and now we're signing million dollar deals. Right. Talk about how consumerization and kind of awareness helps. Right, so I mean, it's so great. I would say that for 90% of the CXOs I go out and visit, or the CEOs, it's like, uh, you know, they'll go, DocuSign. I love DocuSign. I mean, you saved my life. I was buying a house, you know, in uh, New York, and I was out in California. My wife was, in, and we couldn't have done it without that. And so just to have that uh, great experience. And, and, you know, the other thing is, it, it's one of those things where not only do people just love it, but they get really upset if they have to go back the old way of doing things. Fax and scan in, FedEx and, 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 and all that. So that, that helps us uh, a ton. And now in the, you know, as you mentioned, the real estate business, DocuSign is a verb. I'll say any of this stuff, just, just DocuSign it. And that really, that has really affected our business. We just, we just closed a, a huge deal with uh, Merrill Lynch about a month ago. They're gonna roll it out to their 17,000 financial advisors. And uh, uh, a guy named uh, John Teal is uh, the equivalent of their VP of sales. All these guys report up to him. Uh, I, I've, I've known him for years. And um, you know, about a, a year ago, I'm like going, hey, John, man, it's like you guys are just FedEx and all this stuff you gotta get, uh, get people to sign when you onboard them and all, that, you, you know, all the paperwork and you just spend money on FedEx because nobody opens up their regular mail. You guys should be using DocuSign for all your clients. And he goes, well, you know, our clients are wealthy, they're a little older, they don't like to do that, da, da, da. And it was like six months ago, he said, we are getting so much demand um, from our clients that are saying they're tired of doing uh, the old ways. So that is really driving uh, business for us. So it's, it's, it's really going from a nice to have to a must have. And we see that being CEO driven because it's about that um, customer and that consumer experience. Gotcha. And is there any, I mean, it's not all sweetness and roses though because you have this tension all the time between what do you give for free and what do you, you know, what's in the corporate product, what's in the web product. How are you guys thinking about that? Well, you know, at a real macro level, it's like what's the objective? Is it reach or is it revenue? So we always struggle with that. We, we do our best at balancing that. Um, you know, we say reach without revenue is no good. Um, but um, you know, it's, it's actually worked out great. One of the things that we did early on was uh, you, know, you have your sender and you have your signers. And uh, we, we made signing for free. And that was just absolutely brilliant because you know, there were a lot of little upstarts kind of coming up and they were charging for signing and it's for free and that allowed us to really uh, spread things out. And you know, that the uh, the app, you know, our DocuSign uh, Inc. app, which is signed and, and return, has driven demand at all these uh, big customer facing, uh, consumer facing companies. Totally. I mean, I think you guys have done them. I've been amazed as a board member about how much money you could have left on the table if you were ideologically free, which frankly at times I pushed on it. Mm -hmm. I think you guys did a great job of A-B testing it yep. and pointing out that, you know, we get 20 to 25 percent of a very large revenue line from our web-based business, right. and that was money we could have just passed up on, while at the same time using the, 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 the signers for, to get the reach. So that's really, because a lot of folks, when you're building these SaaS companies early on, this is the dynamic you struggle with, and you're right. right. It's not a one-dimensional answer. Right. Kind of stepping back, um, Ariba DocuSign, I mean, you know, you had a huge success, it was, what, 13 years ago now at Ariba, and obviously, please God, DocuSign's tracking in the same direction. You know, what, yeah, you've been the CEO of an enterprise software company in 99, and you see you have a top tier enterprise software company in 2013. Yep. What's different? What's the same? Yep. What's changed? Yep. I, you know, I think in terms of what is the same, it's uh, uh, the company with the best people wins. Uh, it's all about building a high performance team. I mean, I think that's universal. That's, that's absolutely uh, timeless. I think the other thing too is um, 
finding a very big market in the middle of a paradigm shift. So when we started Ariba, it was, uh, we were the first enterprise application written for the internet, all on the internet. Um, and it's kind of like now mobile, um, uh, the cloud is really, is really driving our business, the consumerization of IT. Um, the other thing is, is that network effect. Um, and uh, that's, you, you know, I remember uh, one of our other board members, uh, when he's trying to get me to come on board, said, you know, this is Ariba on steroids. You know, you got senders, you got multiple signers. I mean, Ariba was a total network play in terms of building, uh, uh, you know, the e-commerce network between the buyers and, and, and the suppliers. So. Along those lines, that's that that's really um, that's really similar. I think the thing that's uh, you know the thing that's different is uh, the, the cloud and being able to move a lot faster, yeah. less uh, uh, investment in terms of hardware. The SaaS model is vastly superior to getting those you know big one-time license deal and getting the a maintenance thing. So it kind of allows you. To uh, for the CEO, you know, for the rest of the executive team to sleep at night, um, and also not be so much gas break, gas break. Um, so that's you know that's made a you yeah. know that's made a big difference. So um, I think the speed um, is probably the biggest thing, but uh, way more similarities than differences yeah. in a lot of pattern recognition. Talking about gas break, I mean, I think one yeah. of the things we be interesting to talk about is, you know, you didn't just, I mean, Evan talks about the bubble. Bubbles, Evan yeah. complains about bubbles. Bubbles are great. Yeah. It's, it's all BS when people say, oh, I hate the bubble. What you really hate is when the bubble busts. Mm -hmm. And you lived through the bubble busting, yeah. right? Yeah. You were there in Ariba. I mean, yeah, you were worth $34 billion. I mean, we had companies that were worth a billion dollars for yeah. around one hour or two, yeah. right? Talk about what it was like in yeah. terms of when the tide went out, what happened to the revenue? What did you save the company? You guys yeah. survived. I mean. And yep. you know you had a head-to-head -head competitor, a great company, yep, yep. great CEO, Commerce One. They didn't survive. Yep. Right. What was it like in 01, 02, or three? Yep. Yep. Well, you, I mean, you know, right before that, it's kind of like uh, we had grown 16 quarters in a row, 100% uh, quarter over quarter, Ooh. and we were cash flow positive from the second quarter of existence. Wow. Okay. Um, we only burned through three million dollars in cash before we. Uh, went public. I mean, it was it was on a tear. We were doubling the population of the company um, almost 100 qu percent quarter over quarter. Um, and, and then uh, we went public. And then kind of the the bubble hit, you, you know. And then that turbo turbocharged it um, to the point where you know I remember before a board meeting, Bob Cagle being on the board, and we were both ex GM guys, and he goes, "Croc, do you realize?" Ariba's worth more than General Motors. And I'm going, you're shitting me, you know. And and, and he goes, that was a he goes, how long do you think it's going to last? I go, not forever. He goes, what are we going to do? He said we're going to get 10 years of customers in the next two years. <laughs> we are we are going to put a lot of cash in the bank, and we're going to buy companies with our equity. Um, and so, you know, that's why Ariba. You know, still to this day, you know, number one market share, half a trillion dollars of commerce goes through that Ariba network um, every year. So, um, you know, I remember we, we could kind of see on, uh, on the horizon that um, uh, from forecast that the demand was kind of slowing down. And what's interesting is what, what we actually did back then is we recognized our license revenue over a two and a half year period. Yep. That's how we started out. So we it was almost a little bit of a SaaS, but not totally. So it gave us a little bit of a breathing room. But we could see it happening. And uh, you know, the only way uh, to do it is you got you know you got to cut your costs. And I'll never forget uh, being in the board meeting uh, and saying, "All right, how many of you guys have ever been through a layoff? Whether you've been laid off, whether you've laid people off, you've sat on a board, let, you know, everybody's hand goes up." I go, all right, how many, uh, by a show of fingers, you know, how many layoff situations have you seen before? You know, it's like boom, five, six, boom. So we had a total collection on the board of 39 layoff experiences. I go, okay, all right, now, how many times did you look back when you did a layoff and go, shit, we cut too deep? 
No hands went up. I go, guys, we are going to cut deep, and we cut a third of uh, our workforce, like bam, like that, as opposed to kind of, you know, do a little cut here, a little cut there, and we did it strategically. I mean, we kept most of, we, we kept most of the development guys, most of the sales guys. We had a partner organization of 200 people. We brought it down to five, um, and that allowed us to, uh, to really weather that storm, and then Commerce One, who was our arch enemy, um, they did it cut by cut. They also were making uh, uh, promises to customers they couldn't keep. We were uh, intensely focused on the, on the customer and uh, on product development. And that's you know that's why we put yeah, them out of business. And it's funny, which I wasn't even sure to ask this question because it's such a downer on a good day. But what you learn is there's not a whole ton of time when the tide changes to figure out well what is the meaning of the changing of the tide. Yep. You either know what's happening, you yep. take the moves, or you're done. Right. right? And you know, hopefully it doesn't happen the same way, but always good to remember. Speaking of your board, like maybe one of the last questions and then we're gonna try and open it for some audience yeah. questions is you know, talk about building a board. I mean as you point out to me or I point out to you, you know, the venture guys including me, we've kinda of bought our seats so you're stuck with us until we go public. But talk about the other folks you've invited and what are you looking for in a board member? What do you sure, like? sure. Well, the first thing I want to say is I think we have the greatest board in the world and you're the greatest board member ever. And uh, that is why Kate Crack <laughs> is in sales and was chair of his fraternity. That's all you need to know. Uh, okay. So. Uh, Bullshit aside. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think you, you know, you're looking for uh, a, a diversity of value add. So, um, you know, this last December, um, I said, you know, I'd like to add four board members. Um, and I'll tell you what, what I'm looking for in, the, in that rank order. The first one is uh, uh, somebody who can chair our audit committee, a CFO, great experienced CFO, who's not uh, working full time, um, who could also be um, a great mentor because our CFO, Mike Dinsdale, uh, he hasn't taken a company uh, public before, but I really believe he has the chance to be one of the great um, uh, CFOs in the high tech world, no question about that. And the, the, then I said the second person I want to find is I want to find somebody who has the experience of being a CEO in terms of from startup all the way, you know, running a big public uh, company. Because uh, for me, that uh, um, being able to think out loud with somebody who's been through that as well is absolutely huge. Third, the third uh, uh, is somebody who's uh, just an incredible CTO, great technology guy, all that. And then the, the fourth is a consumer-oriented, tremendous uh, chief marketing officer in terms of branding and all that kind of stuff from the consumer side. Cool. So um, uh, we've been fortunate. We, we've got, uh, we just put on two great board members. One is Lou Levine, who I met, he lives in the same building as me down, down the street. He was the uh, CFO of Genentech during their growth stage. He was the uh, CFO in the biopharma uh, area, uh, top CFO decade uh, of the decade. And he also mentored uh, the CFO at, at Facebook. That's who, that's, uh, that's who took his place. And then Enrique Salem, who was the CEO of cool. Symantec and a startup guy, programming guy, ran sales, did everything. So I, I, I definitely got more questions, but do we want to get some audience questions? Have folks got any questions for Keith? I mean, I believe we have walking around mics. Anyone? Come on. Question. New? Going once? Ah, there's cool. one. Good job. Someone's alive. <laughs> um, at the beginning, you, you mentioned um, that you didn't want to just be a leader, but um, the industry standard. So can you talk about the difference between how do you jump steps from just being number one to being the standard, and what's the, what's the dynamics of that? So the difference, be, yeah, yeah. what was your question, the difference between being just the market leader and the standard? Just being the leader versus being the absolute standard. Yeah, well, um, yeah, uh, that, that means that instead of be, you know, having 40 or 50% uh, market share and you know, the leader, it's 90% plus market share. You know, you always hear about, uh, you know, especially in the software business, the number one player gets 10x the valuation of the number two. If you're the standard, it, you know, it's, kind of, it's logarithmic. 
you're 100x that number too. So, you know, that's kind of the objective um, of the game. And in this particular business, there's a huge advantage um, for the customer for that to be the case and the, and the consumer because they can keep all their signed documents in one place, you know, your DocuSign account, you never need that file cabinet and all that. And it and it's also creates a platform within an enterprise where, you know, all large enterprises and almost all small are in a, uh, have a heterogeneous environment. So to be able to integrate with all these systems that are going out to transact business, whether it's with their consumers, their customers, their partners, their suppliers, their applicants, employees, all that, um, to have one standard platform for that is a huge advantage in terms of their ROI. And, and the thing that's whipping the winds for us now, and, and we, you know, we can smell it, um, um, it and, and this is the same thing that happened at Ariba, is now customers are um, quantifying their ROI and they're talking about it. So, you know, you talk about a Genentech, they say $50 per document, reduce their cycle time by 95% uh, because of, of DocuSign. You hear about CenturyLink expecting savings over $50 million over the next three years. We actually have an insurance carrier that's talking about a billion dollars of benefit over the next five years using DocuSign. That's what really whips the winds of that tornado. And that's what kind of drives towards the standardization. I think just chiming in on that, I mean, I think we're clearly the leader today. I think we're not yet the standard. And I think it's an interesting question because you've got to think about things like, do you have brand? I mean, we're, you're the standard when consumers use you as the verb, right? right? You know, and, a, you know, it's all sorts of interesting questions that we're wrestling with as an enterprise software company. It's how much consumer marketing do you do? Uh -huh. How do you put your brand out in front of the consumers? So we're not there yet. That's actually the next step and where we've got to get to. Absolutely. Voice that boomed. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, I was asking him about how he changed the mindset of the conventional legal profession that signing something online was equivalent to signing something in paper, which in other industries I think that we have to deal with those kinds of mindsets as well. Right. Seems like so, you've done that. Yeah, right. So, that, so that's been a journey for us. I, the the E-Sign Act uh, that made it legal, Clinton signed it in 2000. But, you know, probably for our first eight years of existence, you know, that was the first question everybody asked is, is it legal? You know, and like the older guys, you know, in the company, they're like, going, uh, well, well, we, I go, well, you know, what did you used to say? They said, well, we said, it's not illegal. You know, <laughs> but, um, but <laughs> Which turned out to be a crappy marketing pitch. <laughs> right. Surprise, surprise. Right. But um, now, um, it's not, not only uh, do people understand that it's legal, but a lot of times the chief legal officer or the chief compliance officer brings us into enterprises because you know it's it's easy to kind of forge a, a wet signature but with DocuSign you've got seven levels of authentication you have an audit trail um, on the back end who signed what when and where um, so now it's just the that argument has just totally uh, flipped upside down and a lot of the um, uh, a lot of our business is driven by uh, the chief legal officer, chief compliance officer, chief security officer, because um, you know it's vastly superior to a wet signature. You got one idea? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I just want to ask the question. Uh, they tell me it's extremely rare for an individual to have three major successes, you know, through their business career. So you're very much a rare breed. But um, I just had the question: Was it mainly instincts that? kept you ahead of the curve or your network or you know just the evolution of technology you know just all the factors um, I, I'm just saying I, I hear most people can never get beyond one or two but you've done an exceptional don't exceptional prove him job. right by screwing up the third one just to be clear <laughs> <laughs> that will be bad <laughs> pure luck um, American uh, first of all you gotta like live long enough but um, uh, uh, you know I What's interesting for me is, you know, with each uh, different company, you learn, you don't realize how much you've learned in that previous one until you kind of repot yourself. 
but one thing stays constant is, you know, business is the people business. And the relationships that you build over the years and the, the things that um, you've, you've, you've learned from all the other folks that you've interacted with um, and those friendships you develop along the way, um, I, I, I think it kind of turbocharges, turbocharges uh, you know, each, like for me, each kind of new, new and different company. And, uh, and then, you know, you get a lot of pattern recognition along the way. It's like, hey, should we do this, should we do that? Oh, man, you know, tried that one before. That's, that's just not, you know, that's just not gonna work. Um, so I think, I think it's kind of, you know, for me, for me, it's, it, 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 it's kind of been that. And if I look at it as a, as a CEO, uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, it's all about building a high performance team. Um, I, I'll never forget the little time I had between Razna and Ariba. I was six months at Benchmark. I was the first entrepreneur in residence. And, and I put together a theory called the Magnificent Seven. What are the top seven critical factors that would maximize the probability of taking something from a concept to a sustaining company that's gonna be around for a long time. And, and those seven have held pretty true. Uh, you know, find a big market, especially if it's going under paradigm shift, it's just as easy to find uh, a big market as a small one and then position it. I, anyway, I, I could talk about that for a while. I think it's a great question. I mean, because, yeah. you know, when, when we obviously made the decision to yeah. hire you, you wonder someone who's been so wildly successful in one go-to-market model in the 90s, and it's a very different go-to-market model. Yeah. And I think what I think has worked really well, candidly, is the things that stay the same, like team building and people building and relationships you brought to the table, and then the things when they've evolved, you've evolved with them. Yeah. I mean, we sell so different, as you say, yeah. Ariba, I mean, compare and contrast. Ariba yeah. spent $4 million on cash flow positive right. under the license model. Right. You know, we're going to spend 80 or $90 million, but build recurring revenue that's right. going to be, have more duration. And you've been right. able to adapt to that. So I think it's a combination of bringing, keeping the stuff forever that's true and adapting to the new stuff. And you've done a nice job there. So any more questions? Cool. Uh, along those lines, uh, as Ian mentioned, team's pretty important. Do you guys, from your first company, the second company, even now your third company, have you kept a lot of the same people from, from your first company? You know, uh, quite, quite a few. A combination um, of uh, people who, you know, were from Ariba, Razna people who went to Ariba. Even when I was back at General Motors, I ran a division, the GMF Robotics division. And, and that, uh, that, that is, I think, key. Um, and, 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 you know, one of the things when we're hiring leaders in the company, we want them to bring in a battleship of talent, people that they've worked with before. And so, you know, it's a combination of that. And, and when I came on board, at DocuSign, we had amazing vice presidents. Kept every single, every single one of them, and then we added a whole bunch more. And you've got to do that as you're kind of growing the company, and have guys that can, you know, scale all the way. Um, questions about reach versus revenue. Uh, we're in a small SaaS company, sell to the medium enterprise, now profitable now, and sort of hooked on that revenue stream. But there's a lot of um, back and forth in the organization about the free trial or the, the freemium model or give it away and bring it in. And, and we're very concerned about cannibalizing the revenue stream. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your thought process when you, when you went through the reach versus revenue yeah. Uh, decision? Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh if, if, if your objective is to be the market leader, to be the standard, I mean, you, you've, got, you've got to have that reach. The other thing is you've got to protect your underbelly from startup companies. Um, and, and a great way to do that is, is, uh, is the freemium model. Um, so, uh, you know, that's the thing that kind of turbocharges. Every business, you know, every business is a little bit different. But, Nowadays, I mean, people are kind of, you know, they're kind of used to that. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't know what, uh, uh, you know, what market area your company is, is in. But I think almost if you're, if you're thinking about it, you, you know, if you're asking yourself that question, by asking the question, you're probably giving yourself the answer. Probably do a little freemium there, I would say. I don't even know your business, but anyway.
<laughs> Any more? Don't charge me anything. No. <laughs> don't bill me. Don't bill me. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Keith. So thank you for your fire chat. That was cool. So actually, I have kind of personal question, uh, even two questions. So first of all, who was your best teacher, if you had one? And the second one, what kind of best book would you recommend about how to grow your business? Thank you. So the first question is, who is the best teacher, teacher? advisor, mentor for you? OK. And what was the second question again? Best, best book. Best book. Oh, the best book? OK. So probably my, the best mentor I think I've had uh, was at Ariba, and it was uh, John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco. I, I would uh, have breakfast with him w once a month uh, for four, four years. And it was like, Keith, Keith, you can ask me any question you want, just any one. You know, just, I'm here for you. I mean, he, the guy was the greatest mentor. I asked him everything under the, everything under the sun. And uh, best book, I think, is The Art of War, written by Sin Tzu 3,000 years ago. Whoa, that's not my bet. <laughs> <laughs> nice, OK, cool. Any other questions? I know we're running short on time here. And so the last question, is there someone? Last question, Keith. I mean, you said who gave you, you said it was yeah. your best mentor. The last question is, what's the best bit of business advice you ever got from anyone? Don't be afraid to jump in water over your head. Just do it, because you're going to learn how to swim. Good to know. Hope you can swim, dude. All right. Thank you very much, Keith. And thank you for your work. Thanks, Good job, man.